Thank you so much, Diana. Hello, everyone. Uh, my topic. My topic for today is the impact of Web3 in geopolitics. Uh, before we dive in, uh, I figured I should, since this is my first ever keynote, I figured I should give some information about uh, who I am. Uh, also, I had quite a random background, so. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm the co-founder of It Bucharest. We had our first edition this year. Uh, I'm also like uh, what I call a fake devil because everybody is assuming I'm a devil, but I'm not. I know enough to organize events and connect people, but not enough to be useful in uh, tech settings. Um, yeah, so uh, if you know me, you probably see me as at basically volunteering at all the possible EAT events. If not, uh, this is me. Uh, I have a master's in geopolitics. I know everybody these days is an expert in geopolitics, but I actually have a diploma in a field that everybody is an expert in. Yeah. Uh, I did some work on the dark side. Uh, I used to be a corporate drone, and I also worked for the government, so I figured I might have some useful insights uh, from that side. So um, before we dive in about geopolitics, this has been a term that has been highly used in media. Uh, we've all heard it so far. And there are some common misconceptions, for example, that it's only about war and conflicts, or uh, just uh, the thing about geopolitics is that actually it's more comprehensive than that. Uh, it involves, uh, so it's a multi-faced field that integrates uh, insights from political science, geography, economics, history, uh, sociology, uh, and uh, it helps us understand the power dynamics, and it also has a big focus on power, which is, I guess, one of the most interesting words for uh, most people. Uh, power, there are different types of power, uh, hard, soft, and smart power. Uh, hard power is usually the one that involves using force and strength. Um, the soft one is basically uh, the one that um, uses uh, diplomacy or like cultural exchanges to um, gain influence in certain parts. Uh, smart power is a combination of the two. So basically it has both uh, charm and strength. Uh, kind of like the toxic X you always go back to. Um, so historically, there have been different types of um, power and different attributes or assets of great powers. Uh, back in the day, power used to be about military uh, power or like economic strength. Um, or for example, you could be a great power if you are a member of the UN Security Council. Uh, closer to our days, we've, been, uh, we've heard about cosmic power or power to uh, having access to nuclear uh, weapons. Um, the last centuries have given us a new dimension of power, which is uh, the cyber power, the cyberspace, which of course has become very interesting for all the uh, actors involved in the geopolitical landscape. Um, and of course, um, since the cyber uh, space became a thing, uh, and we're at the Web3 conference, uh, we're, we're gonna talk about the impact of Web3 um, in geopolitics. Web3 uh, is promising, uh, it's kind of like talking about the promised land, um, about financial freedom, because of course we're not gonna be dependent on the traditional uh, institutions. Um, it also promises us better cybersecurity, control over data, so we're uh, witnessing a shift downwards, which uh, in my opinion uh, is a new thing, because we've never actually seen this happen, like uh, the idea of getting the power back to the people. Uh, just a, a small disclaimer here, this is on, on ongoing research, so basically I'm gonna present today just like some preliminary findings. Um, also, uh, Web3 uh, is, promising us, is promising us decentralization of power, uh, which would mean that we will have uh, a need for new models of governance. But, uh, and of course, there's good parts about Web3 because everything being, being open source and transparent. I mean, not everything, but we're getting there, I hope. Um, innovation through shared technological advancement. But of course, any sword has um, two blades. There's also uh, ways in which uh, Web3 can have not the best impact uh, in geopolitics, uh, which can be, for example, as uh, we might know, um, fundraising for malicious reasons, for uh, terrorist organizations, uh, let's say, or uh, sanction, uh, sanctions evasion. Um, how 
would that happen is that basically we maybe all know about the example of uh, the US uh, imposing sanctions on uh, Iran. Uh, and basically, a uh, way in which they could afford this, uh, we, we, they could uh, not afford, sorry, they could avoid this would be, uh, let's say, to have mining activities uh, to gain uh, assets or uh, to use cryptocurrency, which kind of provides you at least a really fair amount of anonymity. Uh, and it's, it can be hard to trace. Um, yeah, and apart from that, um, I have some examples here. Uh, some good examples, of course, we all know uh, about um, the usage of uh, Web3 in fundraising for the um, conflict in Ukraine, which has been a very good, I mean, a positive way of using Web3, even though, I mean, it is about a conflict in the end. Uh, but it's a positive um, example of how Web3 can help with connectivity and can speed up uh, things. We all know that Swift is uh, slow and really expensive. So like, yeah, we've seen this example. And also Ukraine DAO and all those uh, uh, communities that have uh, come back to uh, come, come together to help with the conflict. But then also, uh, of course, uh, whenever uh, a powerful tool comes into place, uh, there are other people who become interested. For example, Web3 can be used as a political tool. Uh, you might have heard of uh, people saying, uh, or Trump saying, uh, a vote for me is a vote for, for crypto. And he's also been using um, cryptocurrency for uh, fundraising for his um, campaign. Uh, then, of course, the alliances uh, in the geopolitical landscape, like BRICS, have become interested in, in this. And of course, like maybe you guys know that BRICS is uh, an alliance with Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Uh, and there are some really interesting actors that are, inv they're involved that are looking to have their own digital currency, which would allow them to have exchanges um, with each other um, with the possibility of avoiding certain things. Uh, then, of course, examples like uh, North Korea, uh, being, of course, interested in crypto uh, and its hackers stealing crypto. Uh, and yeah, uh, this example of uh, using crypto to fundraise terrorist activities, which actually is, I guess, one of the main um, things that people uh, that are against crypto would say. Uh, but honestly, in reality, uh, the number of people, the number of money that's, that is used in, in this uh, case is pretty low uh, compared to the the bigger image. So we're definitely noticing a lot of um, potential for disruption in the traditional geopolitics. Uh, there will be shifts in the power dynamics, of course, because we've seen a unipolar world and then a multipolar wor world, but now there's the possibility of actors such as emerging countries to get power through crypto. Um, because if, for example, they don't have uh, traditional types of power like resources, uh, like nat natural resources or like, uh, let's say, military strength, they could easily um, get a place in the, uh, in the bigger picture um, through using uh, Web3 technologies. Um, then, of course, we have the new communities that are formed, the DAOs and other communities, uh, or like network states, uh, that would require new governance models. So there's definitely um, a big... Um, need for new governance models and for improving uh, the current situation in which um, I guess most of us don't feel like um, our, our views are respected. And of course, there's like also the fact that um, Web3 is promoting um, the absence of censorship, which of course uh, will promote freedom of speech, which is a very good tool for promoting democracy in the end. So yeah, we're noticing uh, this new great asset of power, which I believe um, seems to be very unique and uh, very important because um, it seems like it's the first time that we have a, the, the actual power to do something and to make a difference. And I do believe that Web3 is the most disruptive uh, power of the century. And if, I, I think it's basically like united we stand, divided we fall, because if, we all come together for, for the values that we appreciate and the values that have brought us into this space and not for uh, superficial things. Uh, 
we could potentially make it, and uh, we should protect the devs at all costs, and people that are actually building and that are in, in this for the right reasons. Um, and maybe we could change how things are happening at the moment, and we can actually uh, reach a moment in which uh, the values of Web3 are actually achieved, not just a nice thing to dream about. Uh, because at the moment, it does seem like, it does sound healthy uh, and appealing, but it's not really what's happening in reality. And just like a, on a personal note, uh, I will leave you with this. And remember, kids, the next time that somebody tells you the government w wouldn't do that, oh, yes, they would. And I would know. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Andrea? We do. Thank you. So as someone who studied politics and international relations in college, this is a very interesting topic. So I'm wondering, for example, when you look at the geopolitical landscape centuries ago, it was always a situation of one country on top, right? So it was like a hegemony. And then after the Cold War, things obviously shifted. It was the US versus Russia. Do you think that there's going to be a race for power when it comes to Web3? So, for example, do you think that one country rather than another will try to seize power? We're seeing that um, countries in the Middle East are definitely trying to kind of get ahead. We're seeing some Saudi Arabia, uh, Qatar, a lot of Web3 innovation going on there. Do you think that there's going to be one country that's going to really push for this power to be the hegemon thanks to Web3? Thank you. Um, so we've definitely, see, definitely seen some countries um, already being ahead um, in Web3. But honestly, I believe that if we were to follow the Web3 narrative, this shouldn't really happen. Um, so the thing is, traditional borders no longer exist in the digital world. And I believe that's a very good thing. So if we um, follow those values and we stick to them. Um, I'm really hoping for a world in which power would not be um, in the hands of few, but rather in the hands of... I'm hoping for a state people parity, at least, let's say. That was a great answer. I know that was a tough question. Do we have any questions from the crowd? Let me take a look and see. Yes, there's a question right back there. Can we please run a microphone to the gentleman right there? Don't make me ask you if democracy is realistic. Please don't make me ask you that. We don't have to go there. I mean, we could. The question is kind of multi-layer. Thank you for your presentation. Um, it's a lot of big topics, sort of big vision things, but I'm curious to get maybe a little bit more local and specific. Can you tell us a little bit more about the situation in Bucharest and Romania? Uh, that led you to sort of creating ETH Bucharest? Was this sort of, sort of did, sort of make an intervention into the geopolitical situation? And just in general, what's the landscape like uh, for builders, for, for DGENs, whatever it might be? What's, what's going on in Romania? What's the, what's the vibe like? Sure, thank you. Um, the situation currently in Romania is that um, we are one of the Eastern European IT hubs, and we have, uh, I think, two hundred thousand um, developers at the moment um, so things do look good in terms of like let's say technological advancement um, but what I noticed uh, is that those people uh, need to have like we need to find them and bring them into the real world because uh, right now I feel like there's a bit of a gap between let's say uh, the normies or people that are interested in certain parts of Web3 and the ones that are quite advanced. Um, I think uh, the answer for this would be building strong communities. Um, right now, I, I think we're still at the level in which the focus in Romania is on trading NFTs uh, and meme coins. But I did, um, so the motivation behind uh, having it Bucharest was actually that I've been to a lot of different events and I met uh, a lot of Romanians in really, um, really good projects in Web3. Um, hmm. So um, I think in, in Romania is still 
um, the regulation part is still a bit unclear, so definitely there needs to be work done on that part. Um, but yeah, I think um, if for someone looking to uh, relocate, for example, like uh, for digital nomad experience, uh, it's t totally a good idea because we have the best internet in the world. Uh, but yeah, like I, I do feel like uh, the, the main goal of having it Bucharest is to bring developers. I mean, of course, we want to educate on, uh, the population, uh, the general public, but the, again, we need to protect the developers at all costs. And this comes from me as a non-technical person, and I, I, I truly believe that uh, they are the true di driving force uh, in Web3. I don't know if I answered. <laughs> do we have any more questions for Andrea? Anything? Take a look. No questions for Andrea? All righty. And with that, please give a big round of applause for Andrea Siakoff, founder of ETH Bucharest. You did great.